for the introduction and thanks to the organizers for giving me this opportunity to present my work um, and also for the beer afterwards. <laughs> um, I would still like to introduce a bit myself because what I'm presenting today is not what I'm going to work on while I'm here. Um, so as Manuel said, I'm, I'm working in Lyon and there's one more administrative thing that may be of importance to you. I'm actually responsible for incoming mobility grants. So if you want to come and spend time in Lyon, uh, it's <coughs> rather easy to arrange. So, and you can talk to Amos and Sarah about their experience. Um, and well, I'll be staying the whole year and my office is 169 if you want to come and have a, a chat with me, no problem. Um, I, I want to tell uh, you more about my work because as I say, um, this talk is only part of my work. Uh, so I'm basically working in descriptive linguistics on Amazonian languages, on these two languages that Manuel has mentioned. I'm also doing uh, some works in historical linguistics, um, uh, thinking of the, uh, whether the typological features of Amazonian languages are due to contact. Uh, these days we are working on contact issues between uh, Yukuna and Tanimuka, two Colombian languages, one of the Arawak family and one of the Tucano family. And I'm also doing some internal and comparative historical linguistics. I'm uh, in a project with Lev Michael on um, comparing the morphosyntax, not just the morphology, but also the uh, constructions within the Tupi-Guarani family using phylogenetic methods. Um, so just to give you an idea of the things I'm doing in general. And this year, I'm supposed to write the grammar of Moreno Trinitario, and I hope I will um, succeed. <laughs> okay, now uh, coming to uh, Genderlex. Uh, about 10 or 15 years ago, I heard a Brazilian PhD student talk about uh, uh, a Brazilian language where um, men and women were using different lex, were speaking differently. And it sounded at the same time fascinating and Still, I was, it was like unbelievable, I was a bit skeptical. And then it happened that in the Moreno, there's also a gender-like distinction within the grammar. And then I advised a student uh, who was uh, working on Chiquitano, and there was also a gender-like distinction in that language. And I was like, well, maybe it's not that anecdotal. And that's why I've um, started a survey of gender in South America which the result was published in uh, IJL in 2015. And then the most interesting thing about it, um, I think, was how grammatical gender and gender lex uh, interact. So I've been mainly working on that topic. Um, and what I want to present today is uh, the first result of a worldwide survey that we are um, undertaking with Peter Bakker on the typology of gender lex. So this is Peter, he's uh, right now in Denmark. Um, he's the head of a department at Aarhus University. His speciality is contact linguistics, uh, mainly mixed languages, and it's uh, by working on island carib, which is a mixed language, that he came to um, work on gender lex. And in 2013, he gave a course on uh, uh, gender lex in a very nice setting, a small Greek island. Um, and I went to this very nice <laughs> setting <laughs> and took his class, and then we decided that we would work together on that topic. Okay. So we can start, start on gender lex. So I will give first a very general definition of what a gender lex is. Uh, so it's whenever in an utterance, uh, beside the denotative meaning, um, there is a pointing to the gender of the speaker or the gender of the addressee or to both of them. But it's not really within the denotative meaning. It's just additional information that is given through the, the utterance to the situation of, um, of speech. Um, this is a, an outline of the talk. 
basic introduction, then methodology and results of the survey, and the greatest part of the talk will be on the typology. Okay, so let's uh, um, first start with the, the, the distinction between grammatical gender and indexical gender. I think it really has to be clear before I start the talk. So as you know, you all know here, grammatical gender is about classification of nominal phrases, and there is somehow a link with biological or social gender, uh, but not only. Um, a very basic example from my native language for human beings, depending on their social gender, you will use feminine and masculine, but you can also extend this uh, um, gender distinction to inanimates so that you have two kinds of tables, one table that is obviously feminine and another kind of table that is obviously masculine <laughs> for us French speakers, and that's just the way it is. Okay. Uh, now about indexical gender, or genderlect, or gender indexicality, there's no, uh, how would you say that? There's no widespread terminology for uh, the, the kind of phenomena I'm going to talk uh, today. Um, so indexical gender is the encoding of the gender of one or both speech act participants in addition to the regular denotative meaning of the utterance. Um, a plain example, a mysterious object and two speakers. The man is going to call that uh, object Soso and the woman Zozo. That's indexical gender. These two words have exactly the same meaning, right? They refer to the same object, but they additionally give information on the gender of the speaker, right? So this is exactly what I want to talk about today. Um, indexical gender <laughs> is uh, a phenomenon um, that is um, very diverse, and I will not talk about all possible types of uh, gender indexicality in, uh, today. Uh, so there are three, uh, there are differences according to uh, which speech act participant the gender is indexed. There's these categorical statistical differences and then a variety of domains where gender can be indexed. So let's have a look at this diversity First, um, a very old typology that is uh, just very uh, adequate, re uh, relevant, and still works fine today is that that Mary has, has uh, suggested, with um, type one being uh, the systems where the gender of the speaker is indexed, type two, the gender of the addressee, and type three, that is called relational, is when both the gender of the speaker and the gender of the addressee are indexed. So ideally, you would have four genderlets in these situations, men talking to men, men talking to women, women talking to women, and women talking to men. This is never the case, but we're gonna see that later on. Uh, and basically, type one is, rather, is, is common, and type two and three are rare. This is a rather plain um, distinction. Now, a more tricky distinction is that between categorical and statistical gender indexicality. Um, in categorical gender indexicality, some forms are exclusive to a gender. Uh, so for example, if uh, 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 the gender of the speaker is indexed, you will have one form exclusively used by women and one form exclusively used by men. Um, so this is rather rare. Maybe you had never heard of this before. Well, statistical gender indexicality probably happens in every language uh, where some forms tend to associate with a gender. So cliches are like women will use more um, mitigators, more tag questions, this kind of stuff. Um, uh, so. Um, just one more word about statistical gender indexicality. Um, it's much more complex to describe because it's uh, very often linked, linked to other social criteria, 
and to specific context of speech as well. Um, so it's usually described within the context of social linguistics. Here you have a nice example of this double negation. Um, it's a very old study. But what I like is that it's, it's rather clear that it's not a 100% distinction and that the social class also has to be taken into account. And probably if you take the context into account, like more formal speech and less formal speech, you will also have um, a more um, qualified way of seeing things. Uh, now, the distinction between statistical and categorical gender indexicality is not very uh, straightforward, not always obvious to, uh, to draw. Uh, first of all, because of attitudes. So people may um, think that they don't, they don't speak differently. Uh, well, if you look at discourse, you may find differences. Uh, or the other way around, people may have a very strict way of describing their language, like men do it that way and women do it that way, but if you look at discourse, again, it's a little bit different. Also for diachronic issues, I think there it's very likely that some systems with statistical gender indexicality switch to something more categorical and the other way around. Um, and I must add that some linguists uh, reject the possibility that gender indexicality can be categorical. So everything I'm going to present today, um, some people will tell you, oh, if you really look at discourse, then it's going to be more subtle. Uh, <coughs> with my own corpus, I have six hours of record recordings. I, I have absolutely no exception to the rule that men should use that form and women should use that form. So, okay, let's say it's an open uh, discussion. Okay, and the third type of diversity is where in the language is the gender of the speech act participant indexed? <laughs> Again, I'm not talking about regular person indexation of subject and objects, right? Um, prosodic pitch seems to be an obvious um, domain. Um, which is, at first glance, obvious because of physical differences between men and women. But um, numerous studies have shown that even kids have difference in pitch, and that it's also um, something that can be um, cultural. Uh, grammar is what I'm going to talk about today, so I'm including there phonology, lexicon, morphology, maybe syntax one day but I haven't found anything for now. Uh, choice of languages or varieties uh, can be a, a very straightforward differences between men and women in, in the same community. So there's, for example, a very nice study by Gal on um, a bilingual German-Hungarian village in Austria where uh, men prefer uh, to speak Hungarian uh, because it's the local language linked to the farm, the works, the work in the farms, while uh, women will prefer um, uh, German because it's the language of the cities, more prestigious, and, and so on. Uh, communicative styles also can differ between men and women, um, and not necessarily in the kind of ways I was presenting as cliché. So a very famous study by Kinan on Malagasy shows that uh, uh, women have a more direct way of um, speaking than men. And it would be very, very rude for men to speak directly. They have to use a very indirect way of, of saying stuff. So if there's a conflict, they will ask women to go and discuss it. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, and then genres also, I think this is uh, very obvious that in some uh, cultures, political meetings may be uh, reserved for men, lullabies or uh, other genres uh, will be uh, devoted to um, uh, women. Uh, so most of these domains are actually uh, more linked to statistical differences than categorical uh, once. 
So within this diversity of, uh, of uh, phenomena, I will um, uh, deal with the three types of gender indexicality, but I will focus only on categorical um, uh, phenomena within the grammar. Okay, so I'm really focusing uh, on uh, this uh, type of gender indexicality. And so from now on, when I see it, when I see gender lex, this is to what I'm I refer. A very short review of the literature on categorical gender lex. As you can see, it has been mentioned for centuries <laughs> on a very different languages, but there are actually very few general papers on the topic, and they all list only about 10 case studies, except this one that I've heard of two days ago. <laughs> um, uh, Sasha Heidenwald just sent me a, a book, she's published on uh, gender, and there's a chapter devoted to that topic with a little more than 10 case studies. Mm -hmm. uh, so there's, for now, there's no worldwide inventory and there are only some very preliminary typologies. Uh, there's, however, a bunch of descriptions um, on individual languages, sometimes very hard to find, um, can be very uh, regional journals, and there are very few very good detailed studies, and these are the main ones done uh, study on Chukchi is also very good, actually. Uh, but these two uh, discuss social linguistic things, attitudes, diachrony in more detail. Okay, so um, the aims of our project with, with uh, Petter is to delimit the scope of the phenomenon, offer typology, if possible, describe uses, attitudes, and acquisition, but there's almost nothing in the literature on that for the categorical gender lets, not for the statistical ones, and to discuss directly issues. And in this talk, I will only focus on the first two points. Okay, so we can go to um, the survey. So the idea was to uh, collect all information on categorical gender lets in the languages of the, of the world, and we've collected data from um, these uh, sources, and this is also why I've been passing around the questionnaire that you can use as, as a handout and a reminder, but also, uh, if you're interested, you can use it to collect uh, more specific uh, data on the topic if you happen to know a language where um, this phenomenon Okay, so it seems rather easy, you just read books and collect data, but it's not the case, because if you look at a grammar that has a gender like distinction, you will probably not find it in the table of comments, you will probably not find it in the index, and you don't know how to look for it, even if you can uh, look for the contents uh, in the PDF, because you don't know how the author refers to the phenomenon. So it's actually very tricky, and sometimes, I mean, some people say, oh, just look in my grammar. And then I looked and looked and looked, and I had to write the person to ask, what page is it? <laughs> and then there were like three lines somewhere. Uh, so it was very, very difficult to uh, find information on that topic, and that's also why this survey is going on for years now. Um, another reason is, is that the phenomenon may be very, uh, not salient in languages. So, for example, in Charente, only two words are distinct between male and female speech. And in tupi guarani languages, it's mostly um, observed within the interjections. And I must confess, as the author of the grammar of the tupi guarani language, that in my grammar, there's no section on interjections. So that makes it very easy for other people to look for the phenomenon, right? <laughs> and I'm not the only one. So obviously it's uh, not easy to have, for example, to do a very systematic uh, comparative work of interjections within the family. Uh, and well, this is the last point, of course, the survey, the quality of the survey depends on the quality of the corpora. 
So um, uh, grammar um, that is based on the speech of only men or only women will not give you more uh, much information than that domain. And if you don't record discourse, you will miss a lot of information also, as you'll see as I go on. Okay, um, so I think we can go to the results. For now, we found 102 cases. And from reading Sasha Eichenwald's chapter, I could add two of them. So it's 104 this afternoon. <laughs> um, so obviously, it's a rare phenomenon, but it's many more cases than what was previously um, identified. And some, some um, cases, some languages that show this uh, gender-like distinction are not very well known. It's very, uh, the literature is very difficult to, to find. And I'm pretty sure there are more. So this is an old uh, map. It's not <coughs> updated. Uh, showing the distribution of the gender legs that we've found. Um, and you can see that the distribution is not very balanced. Um, there are many more cases uh, in the Americas, in Southeast Asia, and the Pacific Rim. And it's almost unattested in Europe, Africa, Australia, and Papua New Guinea. Well, what kind of explanations? Um, I think there are four different possible explanations. The first one is that there was a very strong bias. Half of the cases were reported in South America, and that's where I've started my survey. But it may not be the only explanation. Um, it's also an area where this has been described for centuries. So people know that it exists people have a certain kind of vocabulary and techniques for describing it. If you know that uh, within the language family you're working on, there's this phenomenon, you're going to look at it or look for it in your language, so it also helps people describing it. And um, even without that, um, it's been uh, positive that the Americas in general are um, uh, an area where gender legs are most common. Could it be an inherited feature? This is a very interesting question. There are very few pa papers that actually um, discuss it. Uh, it's almost never been reconstructed uh, as a feature of a proto-language, uh, except Li on uh, the Atayal in Taiwan. And even within, um, well, it, and it's uh, because it's, it's never been reconstructed, first of all, because people haven't really tried to do it, but also because in many cases it's a, a very minor feature within the family. So in Australia, for example, only one case for the continent, so one case for the Pam and Jungan family. Uh, and I am yeah, starting uh, to work on this phenomenon in uh, the Tupi family with we have 13 cases out of 70 languages, so this is something we can um, look at. Uh, another point is that even um, in families where several cases are tested, you can find very diverse realization of the phenomenon, so it's not very clear that it's one unique phenomenon. For example, in the macroj family, there are languages where you find it in the phonology, others in the morphology, and others in the lexicon. So I don't think it's really, um, at least it's not one um, very stable phenomenon that can be reconstructed. And the last question is, could it be an aerial feature? So in North America, for example, it's found, um, well, some cases can be dis debated whether it's categorical or statistical um, gender legs. But you see it's only a few languages per family. Uh, but if you look at a map, uh, I think there are some rather clear aerial patterns. And there's been uh, a paper arguing for this. Um, it's more or less the distribution that I was able to uh, spot. For South America, it's not really that clear. Uh, there are some 
area with higher concentrations, but there are also areas where there's anyway a higher concentration of languages. Um, and uh, there's no well-argued case of diffusion. So some people have tried, and I've tried myself, uh, but there's no good case for, for that. Okay, and that's the conclusion for the survey. <laughs> uh, well, we need to do more work on the survey, and I think it would be really interesting to have some diachronic work on the topic, and also on contact. So now we can go to the, the typology. So first I'll present the types of indexicality depending on whether it's the gender of the speaker, the addressee, or both that is indexed. And then I will speak about where in the grammar, in which domains, gender can be indexed. So for the types of indexicality, let's come back to this uh, very simple typology. So first of all, gender of speaker indexicality is the most frequent in the survey. It's the best described. Describe. It's very diverse, but still, um, it is possible to make generalizations concerning the domains of indexicality. So this is what I want to show you in the last part. Um, example of a language where Lexical items are different, some lexical items, uh, very few actually, are different between the male and the female speech. Gender of the addressee indexicality is uh, rather rare, uh, and it's, a little, it's, it's not possible to make like a very broad generalization on, on these different cases. So the most famous um, case study is that of Basque, where the phenomenon is known as allocutivity because it's indexing the gender of the addressee, which is the allocutor or something like that. <laughs> um, and it works only in the register, in the, in the familiar register. So it, you will use allocutive markers, the N and the K, only with people that you say I don't know what's the two form in Basque, <laughs> but that's a familiar second person singular form. So when you are with people you're familiar with, whenever you speak and whatever you say, so please notice that the meaning has absolutely nothing to do with first or second person, right? He or she says. When you want to say that, you're adding this little stuff because you're talking to a man or because you're talking to a woman, okay? It's not adding any information on the message you want to pass. It's just adding information on the, on the setting of the speech act uh, situation. Okay, uh, and the last type, the relational gender indexicality is the one that indexes both the gender of the speaker and the gender of the addressee. You can imagine it's kind of complex, it's rather rare, and there's absolutely no case where you find the expected system with the four logical configurations I was mentioning. So a type of speech between men, a type of speech between women, a type of, of speech um, between, from um, women to men, and one from men to women. This is never the case, it's always more complex, there are uh, sometimes other parameters that are involved, like intimacy, age, and also the descriptions are never really clear on that. Uh, so there's always uh, information lacking on what's going on with the mixed groups, for example, and even sometimes on some possible configurations. So here is an example. Uh, uh, in that language, verbal inflections differ uh, depending on who is talking to who. So there are four paradigms here, men to men, men to woman, woman to woman, and woman to men. But if you really look at it, the first paradigm and the last one are, are the same. So there's actually a speech for talking to men, right? And then there's another one, men talking to women and women talking to women, who differ from 
let's say the other paradigm, um, in certain persons only of the uh, verbal inflection system. Okay, so this is for the three different types. And now what I'm going to present on the domains of indexicality, we'll only use data from the first type, the most common one. It's also the easier um, system to present. So the male-female speech, depending on the gender of the speaker. Okay, so uh, in the uh, preliminary typology uh, we're offering, we distinguish four domains. Phonology, which is actually rather broad, morphology, lexicon, and then a fourth type that I call discourse markers, and I will explain later on why I set this apart. So within phonology, there are actually different um, types of phenomenon, uh, phenomena observed. Um, you can find a distinct phonetic realization of the same phoneme. Um, this is found in several languages, and it, it seems from the literature, but this is something that should be confirmed with more uh, data, that it's not a very stable phenomenon. So at some point, men and women realize differently uh, the same phoneme, but then it will change and in one way or the other. So this is uh, data from CHAM, where in that specific context, uh, word initial consonant clusters, R and Y alternate depending on the gender of the speaker. Uh, but there are two, um, you can see that there is also a, a separate phoneme, and women can also have the re realization in other, um, in other uh, contexts, environment. Uh, phonological distinction, this starts to be a little bit more uh, complex. In some languages, yes? We have a fire alarm going on and off. Just ignore it. <laughs> Thank you. Well, except if it's really loud. No? Um, so, in some languages, the phonemic inventories of men and women are not the same. Uh, this can arise through loss of a phoneme or fusion of two phonemes. And this is best described for these two languages, Chukchi and Kalaja. So, let's look at Chukchi which is very well described by Michael Dunn. Um, so there are two corresponding uh, pairs, ch by women, corresponding to r by men. <coughs> and this actually derives from a protoform that was d. And ch by women, corresponding to s by men. And this uh, comes from a different protoform. So women have been um, uh, neutralizing a, a distinction, a phonemic distinction. And so that when a Chukchi couple are looking for their teapot, she's lo looking for Chaikok and he's looking for Saikok. And uh, there's only one case where um, it's, it is uh, within the prosody of the language that the gender legs differ. Uh, I must admit that it's a very sketchy um, description, but I think it's interesting to imagine that it's possible. Um, <coughs> that's all I can say. Okay, so we can go on to morphology, which is my main interest here. Um, because within the, the array of morphological markers that could have been, that could logically be affected by the gender legs. Uh, it is actually very, very often the case that it's the pronominal markers or the gender markers that are affected by the male-female speech distinction and very rarely other grammatical categories. So let's have a look at Kokama. Kokama is a Peruvian language um, that shows no grammatical gender and still um, there are two paradigms of uh, pronominal markers here. I think uh, it's the, the critics. Um, 
then these two paradigms uh, differ depending on the gender of the speaker. Oh, I haven't told you uh, that I'm using the biological symbols for the gender of the speakers to make it very clear that we are not talking about masculine and feminine, right? So if there is a masculine and feminine distinction, it would be here. Uh, but you can see that these two, um, well, these four forms for third person uh, do not have a grammatical gender distinction, right? So I means he or she, but only women would use that form, right? And Uri means also he or she, but only men use that form, okay? This is simple. So when the gender-leg distinction um, is indexed within the pronominal marker, uh, the pronominal markers of the gender system of the language, um, we can see very complex interactions. Uh, so there are basically two things that are rather complex to describe. First of all, and I won't go into details, I've published a paper on that, when uh, there is a gender distinction within first person only, or within second person only, then you can describe, describe it as either grammatical gender or indexical gender. It doesn't really make a difference, right? First person feminine and first person masculine or first person female speech and first person male speech is basically the same, right? So you will have a, a choice in the analysis if there is grammatical gender elsewhere in the language, or if there is indexical gender elsewhere in the language. Otherwise, you make up your choice. It doesn't really matter. Um, what I'm uh, more interested to right now, and I'm actually revising a paper on that topic, is the interaction of indexical gender and uh, grammatical gender. And I'll just show you three case studies. Uh, and the three of them are very different. So the first one is the language I'm actually working on. It's called Mojeño. It's spoken in Bolivia. And in that language, at least in my corpus, there's only a pair of morphemes that distinguish the male and the female speech. So you may say, oh, OK, it's only one morpheme, not very important. Well, I've done some discourse counts. And of course, if I pick up a text where the main character is a man, then this gender like distinction appears twice or three times per sentence. Uh, if I pick up a text where this is not very really expected that the masculine form will show off very often, then it's maybe once in every two sentences in average. So it still shows up a lot, and it gives, it gives information on who is talking. And maybe I don't, I didn't plan to talk about that right now, but we can discuss about it in the question time. Um, why is it useful um, to actually index the speech, the gender of the speech act participants? Because if I'm talking to you, you basically guess just by looking at me uh, my gender. Anyway, okay. So in that language, why is it so pervasive? It's because these pronominal markers are found in Personal prefixes on nouns for possession, personal prefixes on verbs, personal suffixes on verbs, demonstrative pronouns, personal pronouns, and articles. So everything that is more or less referring to um, uh, referential uh, elements. Okay, so there's a three-way uh, or four-way gender system because of number. There's a marker for non-human. It's to, and it's used by men and women. No difference. Then there's a marker for human, plural, no. Same marker for both, uh, in both male and female speech. Then, within human reference, there are two, two values for singular, one for feminine and one for masculine. The uh, pronominal marker referring to a human singular feminine referent is su in both male and female speech. But when you refer to a human singular masculine referent, 
women will use ni and men will use ma. Okay? So it's within one grammatical gender, there's a gender like distinction. Okay? So that um, if this couple of consultants are talking about a human singular masculine referent, like this little boy, uh, Victor will use Emma and Margarita will use Eni. Okay? Same meaning. Now, the opposite way around, a situation where there is a grammatical gender distinction only in one gender lect. So it's just the reverse situation. This is found in Chiquitano, uh, another Bolivian language that a PhD student of mine was working on. Um, in that language, in the female speech, there is a distinction within third person between singular and plural, and there is no grammatical gender distinction. In the male speech, you can see that some clitics are used to refer to a masculine third person. Okay? So there's this masculine-feminine distinction that only occurs in the speech of men. So, bapacero um, nikusech is a sentence that can be uttered by a woman, and it means she looks for his or her knife. We don't know whether the third person, the subject, is masculine or feminine, and we don't know whether the possessor is masculine or feminine because female um, speakers don't have a grammatical gender distinction. If this sentence was uttered by a man, it would necessarily mean she looks for her knife because there is no masculine. Right? Remember the masculine clitic? Men use clitics to refer to a masculine reference, and there is no marking for feminine. So if you have no marking, it has to be feminine in the speech of a man. Now, this sentence, Bartacero Nikusechti, um, uttered by a man, necessarily means she looks for his knife. There's no masculine clitic here, so this has to be interpreted as feminine, and there's a masculine clitic here, so the perception is masculine, right? And this sentence cannot be uttered by a woman, because there's a clitic that is used only by men, right? So, two complex cases, but they are really nothing compared to that one. Uh, Garifuna is just crazy. <laughs> so, I'm going to try to make it simple. Uh, this is a language where there is a grammatical gender distinction, masculine and feminine. It's actually very simple. Um, masculine is other for male and female speakers, and feminine is to for men and women alike. Okay? So, this is very simple. So if I talk about a human referent, it's very obvious uh, which um, a pronominal marker I should use, and it's the same whatever my gender, whatever the gender of the speaker. Now, if you use abstract nouns or expletive pronouns that are naturally ungendered, you have to assign them a gender, right? And what people do is that women use masculine and men use feminine, logical, right? This is crazy. So um, <laughs> this uh, pair of example with the, the abstract noun help, same meaning in, in the two sentences. The female speaker will use masculine agreement on the preposition and on the deictic, and the male speakers will use feminine agreement. Well, this is what I really find interesting. <laughs> okay, then we can go on to the third domain, which is the lexicon, which maybe was your first intuition of a good domain for gender indexicality. It's not that interesting, I think. Um, it varies a lot from languages, language to language, but on the whole, it usually affects only few items like let's say a dozen of items in average. Uh, 
I've already mentioned Chavante, where it's found only in two words. And there are two languages where it's found in a, a, a large part of the lexicon. Uh, one is very well known, it's Island Carib. Um, Taylor has made a little count with a list of 100 basic items. Uh, and out of this list, 59 items had a distinction between male and female speech, so it's huge, right? Uh, but I think the most important information is that the words used by females are mainly of Arawak origin, while the words we, uh, used by male are of Carib origin. And this is the mixed language I was telling you um, about uh, when uh, introducing Petra. Um, and the, the origin, the creation of the language as a mixed language explains the gender -like distinction. And this is the kind of explanation that uh, is often uh, investigated in various papers for various languages, but I think without really good social or historical evidence for it. So it's easy to say, especially on Amazonian languages. You can always say, oh, women have been captured by men, and then they are it intermarried, and there was a mixed language, and you have no historical evidence for that. Um, I think it's the only case where it's so well argued for. Uh, another case is Atayal Mairinash, um, a study by Lee in the in his in the lexicon that is collected, so out of more than a thousand roots, more than a hundred roots had a distinction between, um, um, for the speech, male and female speech distinctions. Um, and these pairs of roots uh, can be explained uh, with six non-predictable derivation processes and they are non-predictable. That's why this falls under lexicon rather than morphological rules or phonological rules. But they are probably, these lexical pairs are probably explainable diachronically. They are a morphological or phonological distinction. So let me just show you what it looks like. Uh, so two thirds of those cases are explained via affixation in the male speech but there are different cases of affixation and it's not predictable. So this uh, term for sprout, um, rasul, you will add a uh, suffix here if you're a man. Uh, one fourth of the cases is explained via consonant alternation, as in the second example. And then there are 10 superlative forms like that one, the word for pig, that men will uh, um, use Bawak and women Ibubu, where it's really difficult to explain it as a derivation. Uh, so it was, it's, it's a very nice uh, uh, study, and then he goes on um, comparing different dialects. It's not very clear whether they are dialects or languages, but different uh, varieties and, um, and uh, discussing the diachrony of the, of the system. Now, uh, within the lexicon, I should have asked you before, but I'm pretty sure that some of you have, have thought, oh yes, maybe I have something like that in the language I'm working on. And then you've thought about kinship terms. I'm pretty sure because everyone I ask is answering the same way. <laughs> um, so I think there's actually a confusion here. Um, when talking about kinship terms, between indexical gender of the speaker and what I call lexical gender of the possessor. Um, so I will illustrate this with data from my first uh, field, uh, the Emerio language spoken in French Guiana. Eradjut uh, is a term that will be used by men to say my daughter. And Emambut is a term that will be used by men to say, by, sorry, by women to say my daughter, okay? Um, if you look at this, it seems rather obvious that there's a gender-like distinction. The gender of the speaker seems to be important. 
Now, if you look at the same roots with a different person prefix, so A is the first person singular prefix, and zero and E are third person uh, markers. Sorry, it's not the exact same marker. That's just the way it is in the language. But this E and this zero um, regularly refer to a third person, uh, masculine or feminine. There's no grammatical gender in the language. So Tajut means his daughter and can be uttered by men or women. Okay? So it's actually not a root that is specific to male speech. And Imambut means her daughter but can be uttered by a man or a woman. What's going on here? There's no gender in lexicality. There's no grammatical gender. It's just that these two roots don't refer to the same thing. One is the daughter of a man, and one is the daughter of a woman. All right? So, of course, that if you look at these two roots with a first-person possessor, you will have the impression that uh, the distinction comes from the different gender of the speaker. But if you look at the same roots in other contexts, then you will see that it's a general distinction. Is that clear? Yeah. And it's a, I mean, I'm saying it because it's a very frequent mistake, not just in an informal speech, but in most of the literature I was citing, there are lots of explanations based on that. So there are like whole arguments that uh, the gender like distinction come from different types of kinship organization, and and blah, 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 and blah, blah, blah. And if you look at the data, they are always cited with either first person or vocative. It doesn't work. Um, so my um, lesson for today <laughs> would be that when working on kinship terms on these issues of uh, gender, don't look at first person possessor and don't look at vocative or address terms. Just use second or third person. Uh, and the second lesson is that I found absolutely no case of kinship terms indexing the gender of the speaker, even though it's the first natural answer of any linguist. <laughs> it, I have found no case, absolutely no case for that. Okay, so I think we can go on with the last domain, uh, the discourse markers. Uh, so I've set this category apart from the lexicon and the morphology. Uh, first of all, it's a coherent functional domain um, with a strong involvement of the speaker, and it's just very, very, uh, a very common domain for gender indexicality. So under that label, I can have free words, particles, cleavics, or affixes. You can see that I, I don't make any distinction. I, I've just noticed that this is a very important functional domain uh, for gender indexicality especially uh, in South America. So gender, uh, the gender-like distinction is very common in interjections, as you can see uh, here um, in to be running, the outward is very often different for men and women throughout the family. Um, some people have said that it's something universal. Uh, you find that also in markers of uh, assertive modality um, with this discussion that Lakota is maybe not a categorical indexicality system, but more a statistical one. Um, in routines, formulas, and very often you find it in these positive and negative terms, which um, have as a result that when Garifuna people get married, they don't say the same yes word. Um, and I find this nice. Okay, this is um, what I wanted to say today. So just, um, uh, um, I think what is to be remembered is that it's a rare phenomenon, more than 2% of the languages. Still, it's much less rare than previously thought. Um, it's very diverse uh, with three types. Um, type one, gender of the speaker, indexicality being uh, more common. And then uh, there are some regularities within the domains. So within phonology, the pho phonetic alternations seem to be rather unstable. Uh, within the morphology, it's uh, very often the pronominal system that is affected. Within the lexicon, um, it concerns only a few languages and few items, uh, and it's never found in kinship terms. And the gender indexicality in the discourse markers is very frequent in Amazonian. 
And I would like to end on the idea that even though we use the term male and female speech, it's not a very strong diglossia with the whole structure of the language being very different. It's usually actually very minor, uh, very minor differences between the two legs uh, in only one or two domains and only a few items per, domains, per domain. Um, there are still a few languages with a very robust gender-like distinction, and I want also to remind you that a, ver a single distinction can be pervasive in discourse, as I was saying with the <laughs> minima distinction for third-person human singular masculine <laughs> in Mohaim. And this is it. Thank you. Um, <laughs> thank you.